half a million households. All sorts of big problems you could see out there. Where are the problems today? If there's not problems in the real economy, it doesn't matter what the financial markets do. Always keep that in mind. So where are we on that particular front? We'll take the stock market. Yes, stock market was near an all-time high. Guess what? So are corporate profits. <coughs> They've grown, grown faster than any other part of the economy. If you look at a forward-looking P.E. ratio, looks like asset prices look just fine. Indeed, if you do an equity earnings spread, take that P.E. ratio, flip it over E.P. minus a 10-year treasury, even before the sell-off, stocks look like a still good buy. And of course, uh, Business America, <coughs> their financials look good. Not only is profits, but their debt and equity ratios are nice and tight right now. No problems here. And of course, as for the market itself, you can't possibly understand what this says, but let me explain it to you. <laughs> Typically, we have one market sell-off in a recession and then one non-market sell-off in a non-recession period. When I say a market sell-off, I'm talking about like a, a double-digit decline in the market. Since the Great Recession came to an end, we've had four double-digit meltdowns in the stock market, and all four have gone away with nothing happening. Look, the stock market isn't telling you what the economy is doing. The stock market is behaving like a room full of first graders drinking espresso and playing full contact musical chairs. <laughs> There's a lot of noise, a lot of action, and not a lot of logic. So your best bet is to ignore it. Forget the market. It's irrelevant. Just forget it. Okay? And as for interest rates, they're going to stay low for the while for you. And I just told you, the global savings club. How about California? Again, a few years ago, this is a quote. I had to respond to this. I was in San Diego for a bomb buyers conference. And this was the question they put in giant, you know, 117 font on the screen in front of me. Looking back a few years, 2009-10, everyone was saying California's going to fail like Greece and Detroit. Things look different now. What has happened to turn things around? Well, the first thing I said was, not everyone said that. That's a preposterous thing to say. It's a stupid thing to say. Look, I get it. Are we a business-friendly state? No. No, we are not a business-friendly state. I get that. But guess what? It doesn't matter that much. See, that's the dirty little secret. All oh, everybody's constantly talking about Texas. Oh, they're so business-friendly. Kansas is very business-friendly right now. Their economy is imploding. By the way, California, their business and friendliness is not a new phenomenon. I've been here 25 years. It's never been a business-friendly place from what I remember. And it hasn't mattered. California continues to be a success story. Now, it isn't to say we shouldn't be in Sacramento fighting like the Dickens to make this place a little more business friendly, but not because it's for growth. It's for us. It's to help us keep our sanity. That's why you need to be up there and fight that fight. But don't think that this is a growth issue, because it really isn't. Not the way that people try to sell it to you. <clears throat> and look at the numbers. In 2014, California, one of the fastest growing states in terms of output, Texas as well. How much of Texas is oil? How much of Texas is Rick Perry's genius? Well, let's fast forward to 2015, and now Texas is not growing at all from an output perspective. Sorry, Rick. <laughs> California, of course, still moving along just fine. Over the last 20 years, we have 30% growth in our payroll compared to 20% overall. <clears throat> We're in the top six or seven for growth in the nation right now. All good numbers, as the case may be. What kind of jobs? What kind of output? Uh, construction, top of the list, logistics, information, healthcare, hospitality, education, professional, everything growing, good solid numbers. The only thing doing weak in the, in the state in the economy right now is a total farm only up 0.3%. I'll come back to that in just a second. Services up about 1.4%. Financial activities up 1.5%. Government up 1.6%. But a lot of important sectors doing very well. As for output growth from the third quarter 14, third quarter 15, most recent numbers there, we're kind of showing it up. Our economy grew 3.5% over those four quarters compared to, that's about 1.4% higher than the state and nation overall. And I go through the list of rapidly growing parts of our economy, hospitality, management, wholesale trade, construction, professional, and top of the list, one of the most rapidly growing parts of our economy right now is agriculture. Through the roof, from an output perspective, as well as from a revenue perspective. Now this may be a bit of a shock. You probably have heard about our drought. What is going on in agriculture? Well, look, I realize this is an ag community, and I realize this is a sensitive subject, but folks, we, we need to talk just a little, okay? <laughs> Last year, when Jerry Brown said, hey, you urban areas got to suck it up, I was a little surprised, because his, his point of saying, well, all the urban areas have to have a 25% cutback, but the ag areas don't, it's because the ag areas have been suffering. They haven't. Ag employment's at an all-time high. Ag income's at an all-time high. In 2014, the most recent complete data, revenues, middle of a, of a, of a recession, 
Ag had grown the revenues by 5% over the previous year. Ag's doing great. Ag's doing great. So let's stop pretending for a second that they're not. They are. They're doing fine. And I don't begrudge anybody in the ag community doing well. I'm, I'm happy the numbers are up. I'm happy things are looking good. Here's my problem. My problem is how the ag community is making money. Specifically, let me, let me kind of go into this. The most recent crop reports suggest that in 2014, we had about 1.3 million acres of hay growing in the state of California. Hay, incredibly water-intensive, low-value crop. We're talking a crop that per acre uses about five and a half acre feet per year. In other words, all the hay grown in the state of California in 2014 adds up to about 65 to 70 percent of all urban consumption. Now again, hay's cheap. It's 200 bucks an acre foot. That's what you get for it. That up to be clear, that means all the ag production in the state, all the ag production in the state is about 2 percent of ag revenues. This is a low value water intensive crop. If we just halved the production of hay in our state, we would have plenty of water for all the other needs, for all the other farmers, for all the nut guys out there, and for the urban areas. We could refill our reservoirs. And ag revenues would have still gone up because that tiny little share of ag revenues is less than the growth in revenues from 2013 to 2014. We gotta be serious about this. And by the way, I'm not telling the ag guys, I wanna take your, your water away, not at all. <coughs> I wanna pay you for your water. Because guess what? A hay guy, he's making 50 bucks an acre foot he's using. San Diego, they're willing to pay $2,000 to desalinate. I, I see a transaction here, folks. <laughs> How about you pay them $100 for that water? Oh, I got an idea. There's so much value left over, <coughs> we'll put $100 in to restore that land for environmental or recreational use. And I'll throw another 100 in to develop a fund for economic development in those ag communities. The only people who suffer from this particular transaction are Chinese cows and pigs. Because that's where a quarter of that hay is going. It's been put on boats and shipped to China. This is so obvious. This is so good for every part of California to have this conversation. Why don't we? Why isn't it happening? Why can't San Diego pay that hay guy in Imperial County for that water? Because we have 1,300 water districts. That's why. The water districts control the water, but they don't profit. If they sell it, their job is to take the water and give it to the people they've always given it to. To take usage and separate it from ownership is insane. That's not how you manage a scarce resource. So let's, let's take a deep breath, take a step back from the ledge here and recognize a little bit of logic applied to the allocation of one of the scarcest resources our state has can do a whole world of good for everybody in this state. Everybody. But we gotta start with that point. How about another issue that bothers me? Hey, incomes are up in the straight state, growing faster in the U.S., that makes me happy. Taxable sales growth growing faster here than retail spending in the nationwide. All good news. Ah, but again, people in Sacramento, they're all very happy about the fact that we have lots of money coming in the coffers right now. Ah, but the problem, we're getting all that money because of the capital markets. See, because of Prop 13, we've had to dip deeper and deeper in the personal income tax. Prop 30 made it even more so. We have the highest marginal tax rates in the nation. No, I, I, look, honestly, I'm not fussed about that. You want to soak the rich? Five, far, do, go ahead, I don't care. I know better know that income taxes are that big of a diminishment of effort. But remember that room full of first graders drinking espresso? That is now our state budget. We have internalized the chaos in the stock markets in our budget system. We've seen this play out before. We saw it in 2000. We saw it in 2006. Massive budget deficits appear overnight when the capital markets tank. Th that's not a way to run a state. We've got to get off this train. We've got to rebuild our revenue system. Because guess what? Whatever's there now will disappear like that the next time there's a market meltdown but no one's talking about it. They just want to extend Prop 30. Haven't we learned anything? Come on, we can have a real conversation about this. Not hard. How about local growth? What's happening here? Well, Kern, near the bottom of the list, 1.2%, one of the slowest growing ones. Now, you know, a few months ago, it was actually down. It's starting to come back just a little bit. This is obviously oil. No doubt about it, but here's the key. As bad as the oil situation is, as much as the slowdown has occurred, the county is still growing. There's still good numbers out there. And you look at the numbers going on right now. What's growing? Retail trade, education's up, government's up, hospitality's up, logistics is up, 
All good, solid growth numbers here. The only part of the economy that's down, obviously construction wrapped around oil. Mining, of course, is down 21%, lost 2,700 jobs there. Manufacturing down just a little bit as well. There's no doubt the county is taking a bit of a hit right now. But again, take a step back. Let's get a little perspective on this. Let's look about things in the long run. Look, current has been one of the fastest growing economies. There was barely a recession here compared to the rest of the U.S., um, compared to the rest of the state. Right now, compared to 2000, this area has 35% more jobs compared to 15% overall for the state. These are good numbers. Unemployment's continuing to fall here as well. Yes, it's a bump in the road, but that's just it. It's a bump in the road. The place, just like Dallas is working its way through, this is like Houston is working its way through, so is Kern County. So don't let what's happening in oil think that it means Kern's going to slow down or even stop growing. Not at all. The fundamentals, what's going on here, are fairly important. And you know, that's true for most of the South San Juan King Valley. We did a study not too long ago for the area here. And I hear some of the rhetoric, unemployment rates are high. The area is in a depression. Read a book before you start making pronouncements like that. The South Central Valley does have a high unemployment rate. Why? Because of ag. When you have ag, you have to have low-skilled workers to deal with that. And low-skilled workers, by definition, have a very high unemployment rate. That's just the nature of the beast. As long as you have ag, your unemployment rate's going to be higher than the rest of the United States. Simple as that. And that's okay. The key is the, the trends for, for unemployment. And look at the unemployment. Look at it here. You know, in the middle of it, it was about 16%. Right now, it's down to about 9%. So things are fine. And if you look at the Central Valley, all the big growth that's been going on here, and you say, well, what does it mean? For the four counties, Fresno, Kern, Kings, Tulare, you're talking two and a half million people. That's more people than New Mexico. Aggregate output here is about $68 billion. That's more than Hawaii or West Virginia. This is a big, rapidly growing economy you're sitting in the middle of. This is an exciting place. Yes, there's a bump in the road. Forget the bump. It'll be behind you, and there's lots of other things going on here. Take, for example, economic output. Again, growing much more rapidly here than the rest of the state, or as the rest of the United States overall. Mining is a big part of that. 25% of the increase, one-fourth of the increase in output over the last uh, 15 years or so is wrapped around oil production. But finance is up there, ag is up there, wholesale is up there, professional is up there, healthcare is up there, manufacturing is up there. In other words, there's plenty of other sectors that are going to continue to thrive. And once you move through the oil slowdown, all these other sectors are going to start growing. Just a function of paying attention to the fact that there's lots of other things happening in the local economy. And you certainly see that in taxable sales as well. It is true, of course, that some places like uh, Taft or Arvin are down. But on the other hand, Baker, uh, uh, Bridgecrest and Wasco and Delano are all heading up in terms of sales. There are people are buying stuff. And last but not least, I want to talk about housing, state housing. You know, we have been so proud, if you will, the fact that our state's growing so rapidly, almost 3% on a year-on-year -year basis in terms of job growth. Labor force is only growing at 1%. That only works when you have slack in the labor force, a high unemployment rate. But now, unemployment in the state continues to fall, fall, fall. We're getting to the point where suddenly there's very little in the way of slack left in the labor market. If we want the state to continue to grow rapidly, it means having a workforce to do that. Unfortunately, we're not building housing for it. Housing right now is becoming very, very expensive, and this is primarily a supply phenomenon. Look, single family has barely come back. Multifamily has come back, but single family barely has. Overall, new population permits in the state, about four to one. We're already underbuilding in the midst of what we already have in terms of, of a housing shortage. Now, locally, prices are going up as well. You can see a little better numbers in terms of permit, about 2,100 new permits in 2015 compared to the previous year. Some recovery, but still relatively slow. Now, there's no bubble. Again, this is not a function of prices getting too far or too hard of themselves. In fact, if you account for interest rates, it turns out housing is still affordable in California in our own shockingly unaffordable sort of way. We have one of the worst overcrowding styles, you can see, one of the lowest vacancy rates out there today. Why don't we build enough housing? Very simple, CEQA Prop 13. CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, as we know, the regulation that, while well-intentioned, has been used and abused by every special interest in NIMBY to fight against anything, anywhere, anytime, all the time, no matter what. I don't care what it is. And, of course, Prop 13, our beloved property tax system, which not only forces us to be more and more reliant on, on the, that hyperactive personal income tax revenue stream, but also which diminishes the incentive for local cities to invest in housing. Look, sit down with a finance person in a city. you got 20 acres of land. What do you want to do with it? Go through the list. I want retail. Lots of tax revenues. doesn't cost me anything. If I can't have that, I want other kinds of commercial. If I can't have that, I'll, I'll suffer with single family. Last but not least, what I do not want is multifamily residential. It's 
very low tax base, costly tons in terms of services used from roads to, to police to ambulance to schools. That's a loser. I don't want it. You got, if you want cities to build housing, if you want cities to fight against the NIMBYs using CEQA, you have to incentivize them to want that kind of housing. You can't just waggle a finger and say you should do it because you should do it. Any policy that relies on better nature of human beings to succeed is going to fail. And you know, I like to say this more than anything else. You, if you don't believe me about housing, take a look at this. This is net migration in and out of the, you, you, California. You will hear this story all the time. People flee California because of high taxes. Actually, no. High-income people are more likely to move into California than leave. It's low-income folks who leave the state, and that, of course, is because of, of high housing costs. That is the primary driver of people leaving the state, not taxes, not taxes. And indeed, that actually is good for Kern County at some level. Because when you have the reluctance to build enough housing in the core part of Southern California, and like it or not, you're part of Southern California, that pushes growth to the periphery. Look, if you look at what's going to happen in this state over the next 20 years, this is a projection straight from the Department of Finance. Los Angeles is going to add 976,000 people in the next 20 years. That's 9% growth rate. Kern County is projected to add 400,000, almost half as much as L.A. That's a 44% growth rate. Why are they coming here? Because of housing, because you can build, because you can do things here. So forget about oil. There's a lot coming down the pike. This here area has huge growth potential because California has growth potential, and you're part of that growth margin, as the case may be. So... I got some forecasts here. I'll let you chew on that. We'll have these slides available for you so you can, you can, you can look at them later. But we're looking for a return to normalcy. Job growth is going to come back. We think that you work through the worst of the mining situation at this particular point in time. Overall, looking a little longer term down the thing, huge potential for Kern County, huge potential for the city of Bakersfield. So the key here is to make sure that we focus on policy issues that make sure that occurs. Investment in infrastructure, investment in education, investment in housing. It's there. So I'll wrap up very quickly with this. What do you worry about, what you don't worry about? Don't worry about the dollar, worry about China, don't worry about student debt, worry about educational choices, don't worry about asset bubbles, don't worry about bad financial regulation, don't worry about drought, worry about water policy, don't worry about labor markets, worry about growing wealth inequality, don't worry about business, worry about California housing, don't worry about California tax levels, worry about California tax structure, don't worry about politics. You know, that's, that's the last thing. And I'll say this. I'm going to go back to my first message, what I said. Look, I'm watching this presidential debates, and it makes me crazy. I listen to the, what, what talked about in terms of what's important and what's not, and I see him missing the point. But the key here, of course, is about political engagement. There are relatively simple solutions to the problems that bedevil us. The, you don't need a PhD in economics to understand these things, these solutions. What well, you do need a PhD in is psychology to understand why somehow or other our, psych our, our political leaders have completely divorced themselves from the reality of the ground level situation. But part of that's being involved, part of that is having conversation, part of that is standing up here the way I'm in front of you and talking about the real issues and to understand that there is a middle ground, there is a way of dealing with these things that's good for everyone. Thank you very much everybody, have a good couple of years. Chris, thank you very much for that. We appreciate it a lot. Our next speaker, Robin Padgey, is the training coordinator at WorkLogic HR, where she creates and delivers training on topics such as harassment prevention, communication, and supervisory skills. Robin is a senior professional in human resources with a state-specific certification in California. She's a certified professional in learning and performance, a certified professional coach, a certified DISC personality profile trainer, and a master practitioner of the Myers-Briggs type indicator. Robin holds, a master's, holds master's degrees in communication studies and human resource development. So would you please help me welcome Robin Padgey and her panel.
and my panel members can make their way up here. And while they're doing, why is everybody leaving the room? So we're waiting until everybody comes back from potty before we get started, I'll just tell you that. Um, I'd like to let you know also that I do moisturize. I look a lot younger in my head than I do in person or on TV, though that's unfortunate. There we go. Good morning. Yes, just have a seat wherever you would like. Uh, so I'm going to introduce these people a little bit later and why they're here. Um, and what we're going to do is talk about the different generations. So Chris already got the generation bashing started. So thank you, Chris. And Chris has left the building. Um, Chris didn't tell you his wife is due at any moment, and so he needs to go home. And yeah, all the ladies went, ah, the guys are gone. Yeah, we don't care. So uh, the generation bashing has begun, and if you didn't get some of his jokes, then I will tell you what the generations are like in general so that you get the joke. Uh, one of the things also is that I want to point out that different people call the different generations different names. And they also have different uh, timelines of birth dates. And so we need to come to a consensus about what we're going to call folks. Um, I know that Ryan has different names for his generations than I have for mine. I'm up at the podium now, and I am older than you, Ryan, so I get to name them, and then you have to change your PowerPoint in order to go along with what I'm about to tell you. Now, it really doesn't matter what we call the generations. And we need to understand we are generalizing. Everybody doesn't fit nicely into these generations. It gives us an idea, though, of where we need to start conversations. So when we're talking about generations, we'll see if my little clicker works here. All right, see, I'm over 40, so I don't know how to work the technology. Can somebody under 30 come up here and help me work the technology? That would be lovely, please. Seriously. All you need to do. All right, very good. All right, so we're back. Yay! So the events and conditions each of us experienced during our formative years help define our worldview. What's our formative years? 14 to 18, roughly. So what was going on in high school has shaped us as people. Yay, that's exciting news uh, if you went to high school when I did it and where I did. So the generation that we grew up in is just one of the many influences that we have. But I do prescribe to this. And one of the examples I will give you is what is the best music ever. The stuff that you heard in high school, right? Yes. Uh, some of you are saying, no, I beg to differ, and uh, Fleetwood Mac and Queen are the best bands. So there you go. All right. So we're going to look at the different generations. Now, the oldest generation in the workforce, and yes, there are still some of these folks. So look at these dates. Born between 1930 and 1945, and I think Ryan's dates differ a little bit. He also calls them traditionalists, while I call them veterans. They're also called the greatest generation, radio babies, whatever. There are still some of them in the workplace. One of our panelists is going to tell you she has employees in her 80s. They will not go away. Yes. So my dad is turning 80 next week, still goes to work every single day, and he plans to die at work. And that's what he wants, and we'll just move him into storage and we'll keep on going. <laughs> so what was happening during their formative years? Well, we know this story, the crash, the depression, World War II, look at what they were watching at the movies as opposed to what we were watching at the movies these days. Uh, the New Deal, which uh, Roosevelt created to get people back to work, and that work was mostly manual labor. So as a result of growing up during that time and shortly thereafter, Okay, seriously, you're just going to have to click the button. Yay! All right. They tend to have a practical outlook. What does that mean? They don't like to spend money. Uh, their work ethic is dedicated, and so they tend to stay at one job for most of their lifetime if they possibly can. 
they respect people in positions of authority. Because you're in a position of authority, you probably earned it. And uh, because you're older than I am and I was learned to respect my elders, I will give you respect. That has changed tremendously for very good reason. Uh, leadership by hierarchy or hierarch that I have there. Um, and they believe in sacrifice. You sacrifice before you play. They're very civic-minded for the most part and make do or do without. And so if you're like me and you were tra uh, raised by veterans, you were given a credit card to use only in case of emergencies. And if you ever had an emergency, you better be dying because that's the only emergency they recognize. So spending, uh, uh, putting things on credit was not something that these folks did. If you don't have the money, you don't get it. All right, so here are the boomers. Uh, and uh, I was amazed to find out I'm in this group. I thought my parents were the boomers. And I was like, no, yeah, if you're born before 1964, you're a boomer too. Sorry to burst your bubble uh, if you didn't know that already. So the older boomers, and this generation is 18 years. And so the older boomers were doing Vietnam and civil rights and integration, sexual revolution. I wanted to have a picture up there about the sexual revolution, but I was told it was inappropriate, especially as an HR person. So I took it down. All right, and the space race. So as a result of living through this stuff, and by the way, if you're a younger boomer like me, born between 1960 and 1964, we have our own special designation. Of course we do, because we're special. And uh, that designation is Generation Jones, because about when we were hitting uh, graduation in the 1980s, uh, it was Dynasty and all of these uh, big houses, big mansions, big hair, big shoulder pads. You were, if you were in the 80s, you were there, big hair, big shoulder pads, purple eyeshadow, yeah. So. Keeping up with the Joneses became the motto at that point. And so we're Generation Jones. So I feel especially cool. Uh, don't, because most of us go to prison and have illegitimate children. So that's what happened <laughs> with that. Yeah, it was all that free love stuff that happened uh, before us. So. All right, so how are boomers optimistic? We're good team players. We got credit in school for participation. Yeah, we think uh, the millennials are the babies and hand holders. No, we got participation points. Uh, but we tend to be very driven and take our work very seriously, and we love titles to demonstrate how serious and important that we are. Uh, view of authority, we hated it as when we were younger. Don't trust people in positions of authority. Uh, but now that we're in positions of authority, we love it and we want to be respected because we're there. Uh, let's lead by consensus. Let's all play as a team. Uh, personal gratification, I am trying to get plastic surgery. My husband won't pay for it. Perspective, let's all work together as a team. The Gen Xers who are cynical, yeah, they hate that stuff. Don't try it, it doesn't work. And be anything you want to be because during our formative years, all of these careers that were never heard of before came to light and women, could have equal rights and go to college. There are more women going to college now than men are. And getting degrees and, and being all that you can be, and, and that's what worked. And so that's what we still believe. We don't want to retire, most of us. Somebody asked me the other day, are you retired yet? <laughs> I hit her and then told her, I have 20 more years until I'm retiring. Don't force me out, I'm in my prime. All right, so that's just a little tidbit for you, Ryan. All right, <laughs> what else? So here's those cynical Gen Xers. I think Chris was a fine representative of them. And so what was going on? Now, this is 1965 through 1976. The only clear dates of any of the generations is the boomers. Why? because the birth rate skyrocketed after the war and then it fell in 1964. Why did it fall? Birth control was invented. Yeah. Gen X is the smallest generation. There are about five of you who raised your hands. Yay, I'm Gen X. Yeah, you're overnumbered. Keep your hand down. All right. So what was happening to make these people so darn skeptical? Divorce because the women's movement allowed women to get into the workforce. Uh, single parents, latchkey kids. So here's a big clue. Lots of them were taking care of themselves and sometimes younger siblings while their parents are at work. That's why they're so darn independent. 
Uh, Watergate and Iran-Contra, so people in positions of authority can't really trust him when your president has to leave office and he still insists on the way into the helicopter. I am not a crook. You remember it, watching it on TV. Yeah, Sally Wright and Vanessa Williams, so women in space and Miss America and women can be all they can. And then technology boom, these were the ones. Now, boomers, we were alive during the technology boom, but some of us didn't embrace it. Gen X embraced it and ran with it, and that's part of their expectations. So here is that skeptical word, yeah. Uh, balanced, so while the boomer parents are finding themselves and their identity at work and working those long, hard hours to demonstrate that they're good team players. Generation X was at home going, yeah, I'd rather have a life outside of my workplace and I will make that happen, thank you. And I will only be working 40 hours a week or 50 if I absolutely have to and then I'm gonna go home and have a life. Uh, view of authority unimpressed, just because you're in a position of authority, don't tell me what to do. Uh, leadership by competence, you want to be my leader, prove it. A reluctance to commit to organizations as well, because if you can't give me what I need, then I'm moving on. And not only that, I was chagrined to read on monster.com advice by them that if you are young and if you are in a job for two years and you have not gotten a raise or a promotion, you need to get out because you're a loser. All right, so that's the advice by monster.com to younger people. Uh, perspective, it's all about me and don't count on it. They're a skeptical, unimpressed generation, so good luck working with that. <laughs> all right, so I call them Gen Y. Ryan calls them millennials. I'm at the podium, I get to name them. Gen Y, so around 1975, 1995, somewhere around there, and what was happening to these folks? Well, they grew up on technology. And if you're like me, your five-year-old grandchild can work technology better than you can. Yes, so they expect it, they like it. It makes life easier, they don't know life without it. Clean Air Act and the ADA, so we had some stuff coming into our environment and to our government to make us uh, behave and to uh, keep things clean for the next or next generation. Columbine, so uh, this is a generation that started to see unsafety everywhere. And now we have school shootings almost every day. We have a mass murder which is considered four people being killed at one time. We have a mass murder every day in the United States. This is what this generation is growing up with. Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill. So sexual harassment's been against the law since 1964, but it really took off in the early 90s with the televisation of this hearing. And so those of you who are too young to know what I'm talking about, this lady went and said a, a nominee for a Supreme Court judge had sexually harassed her. And then the lawsuit started, and uh, of those of us who are in HR and employment law, thank you, Anita Hill. So Operation Desert Storm, we're back at war. Clinton and Lewinsky, we have the president. Now, he wasn't the first one who had sex with an intern in the White House. He wasn't the first one, but he did go on TV and lie about it. And most people, I remember, said, well, everybody lies about their sex life, so who cares? That's what the generation uh, that's watching this was taught. By the way, more people admit to cheating on their college exams than ever before, and they're admitting it because you gotta cheat in order to get ahead. So that's what they were taught. And then of course 9-11 happened. Now, we all experienced 9-11, but when you're 10 years old or 12 years old or 14 years old and you're watching those towers come down, it's a lot different than when you're 35 years old, which is how old I was. So what happens to us during our formative years has a huge impact on our worldview. And so what's Gen Y like? Well, they're hopeful. Why in the heck are they hopeful? <laughs> what do they have to be hopeful about? Well, Chris told us the economy's good. We're good, that's all I heard. I was a communication major, so I didn't understand most of what he talked about. All I heard was, you're okay, and so I'm going shopping. So, uh, work ethic. <laughs> Work ethic, ambitious. They're ambitious? No, they're not. They're a bunch of slackers. No, they're not. 
they are ambitious and monster.com is telling them you need to start rising up in the ranks and they want to do that. By the way, those of us who went to college, which is probably just about everybody in the room, don't you remember when you were in college and people were telling you, you need to get degrees because you'll get that corner office and more money if you do? We were all told that. Thank you, CSUB. Uh, got two of my degrees there. And uh, we were told that, and we believed that. And I, too, when I graduated, wanted that corner office and was not going to make any less than $50,000. And I was a secretary, and I made $25,000. And that's how that worked. So that's, we can't blame people or fault people for thinking that college degree is going to get them stuff, because that's what we were all told. All right, leadership by achievers. So they want to be achievers. They want to be led by achievers. Just because you're in a position of authority doesn't mean you know what you're talking about. Our president lied about having sex in the White House with an intern on TV, and so just because you're in the position of authority doesn't mean you know what you're talking about. They tend to be loyal as long as you are in a relationship with them. Their perspective is civic. They grew up having to do community service as part of school. Now, if you're a boomer, you might have done community service too. You're wearing an orange jumpsuit and you're picking up trash. Community service means different things. Not that I would know. Community service means different things for these folks. And they were told you are special. You are special. It's your fault, all right? It's your fault because of the fracking stuff. It's your fault because of oil. It's also your fault for the younger generations thinking they're special. You raised them. And so that's what happened. So next generation. Now, Ryan calls the next generation Gen Z, and, and nobody's got a name for them yet. People are trying them out. So Gen 2020, iGen, I like Gen, iGen. iPhone, iPad, iPod, iGen, it makes sense. Uh, Gen Z, okay, Linksters, somebody came up with that. Yeah, it's not, so we don't know what they are. Uh, but roughly, these are the folks born after 1996. And so this is a definition that I heard that I really liked. It was, if you were too young to remember 9 11, you're in this generation. If you remember 9-11 where you were, you're in the previous one. I like that distinction. That makes sense to me. All right, so technologically dependent, dependent, not necessarily savvy, dependent. I had people coming to my house to clean my carpet. I live on 20th Street, and I told them where I address. They called me. They were in front of the Greyhound bus station. They said, do you live at the Greyhound bus station? I said, not yet. And they said, well, we don't know how to get to your house <laughs> because we put it into Google Maps, and we don't know how to get there. And I said, you're on 18th Street. I live on 20th Street. Figure it out. And they said, no, really, can you tell us? I had to tell them. That's scary. All right. Closely tied to their parents, tolerant of alternative lifestyles because they have lived amongst boys wearing makeup and uh, girls playing World Cup soccer and all sorts of stuff that is different than older generations, and involved in green causes and social activism. And so they'd like time off work to go read to students in elementary school, and they'd like you to pay them while they're there. Not necessarily a bad thing. All right, so that's them in a nutshell. Okay. Oh, here we go. Oh, now we went too far. There we go. All right, then. So we have a panel of folks up here. And who are these people? Well, they represent industry leaders and managers and people all over Kern County. So we really tried to represent the entire Kern County here. So we have Sandra Bloxham. And Sandra is... I've got it, the employee manager at Grimway. Let me get everybody's title. Employee relations manager at Grimway. So we've got South Kern County representative. Then we have Aurora Cooper, who is the chief, chief human resources officer at Om Omni Family Health. Now, they're here in Bakersfield. They also have some locations in North Kern. So we've got North Kern represented. Shauna Shearson, Kern School's Federal Credit Union. And Shauna is the vice president of contact center and training in the communication center located right here in Bakersfield. So we got Central Kern. And then we have Harris Starkey, who is the general manager of West Kern Water District. So we've got Taft. So we've got West Kern. And then we have Jennifer Wood, who is the mayor of California City. So we've got East Kern here. So we've got representatives from throughout the industries and the region, and they are here to tell us some of the problems they have encountered, not with millennials, we're not just going to bash millennials, but the 
managing five different generations in the workplace. So, uh, Sandra, there you are. Oh. Good morning, let's start with you. Good morning, everyone. Um, well, basically, I work in the agricultural industry, and not only are we tasked with working with different generations, but we're also tasked with working with different minorities, which is something actually we hadn't touched on yet. And you know, the, our preconceived notion of what we think each generation expects is also sometimes very much um, structured around our family lifestyle, just like Robin mentioned. But the problem is we have to remember culturally there may be a difference as well. So even though you may be dealing with a generation, you may have an anticipation of how you feel they may want to be managed or treated at the workplace. What you have to remember is the influence that they have at home, which for us can be a challenge. Um, we have very savvy, intelligent employees that work for us, but their home life is very different. And so sometimes it, it takes a little more time to figure out what makes them tick and, and understanding, understanding better how to make them uh, feel welcomed, be motivated, and of course, learning what will um, help them in their growth. So for us, that's been the challenge, is understanding not only the generation we're working with, but understanding the formation of, of their way of, of being. Great, mm -hmm. okay. Aurora. Hi, good morning, everyone. So I work with uh, Omni Family Health, so we have health centers throughout Kern County. A lot of the things that we have to deal with is as an employer, we have every single generation working for us, even the traditionalists. So um, some of the biggest things that we have is uh, the expectation that each generation has on another. So for example, I have several, talking about managers, a lot of managers with indifferent of the traditionalists, uh, baby boomers and Gen Xers are supervising the um, Gen Ys, and we have several millennials. Or I call them millennials, sorry. So <laughs> the, the younger ones, uh, we have several of those. They compose of, uh, I think, maybe 40%, and then we have um, Gen Ys that are composed of at least 60, I already said, I counted too long. It was about three-fourths of our, um, our employees. So our supervisors are having, one of the biggest things, the challenges that I have uh, also is we do need to educate them on the different, uh, we educate them a lot on the diversity, however, it's educating them on the differences in the different generations. So we have people like Robin Padgy coming in and helping us with that. So what we're having to do is basically um, having them understand uh, the diversity on the differences that we have and focusing the problems that we have on work. So we have a lot of new uh, staff who come in. Like I said, it's at least three fourths of the, uh, our employee population and is having to um, have an understanding of what each one of them, what expectation is. We do have to train the younger generations on what the expectations are. Um, the older generations are having to explain more what the expectation is. Uh, it's not so much of uh, this is the way they should know how to do it. We actually have to explain that to all of them. And the biggest thing is also all generations want the same thing, which is respect. Um, our older generations want to respect on their experience, others on professionalism, and the younger generation want on their ideas and what they bring to the table. So they just want to be heard. So that's kind of some of the things that we're having to deal with. I can echo what Sandra and Aurora said are some of the challenges that we have and boils down to expectations and different communication styles. The, are the, we have a lot of tellers and those tend to be young people, either millennial slash Gen Y or even now some Generation Z team members coming up and they're being supervised by people in, in older generations and they have different expectations and so we do a lot of resetting of expectations and teaching the young people how to work in, in our workplace and also trying to show that they are valued, trying to keep some harmony there. I do want to share one particular issue, that this being the economic summit, it's, it comes down to sort of a financial issue for us that, that I'm, I'm working on right now. As uh, being responsible for training, I have to look at how the different generations learn and, and technology is a big issue with that. 
we have a position that's our, our new account and loan officer position, which is has a lot of technical and software tasks required, but it also is a sales position, so it requires that the people have great interpersonal skills and sales skills. And typically, we promote from within and groom over time. We're opening uh, the Delano branch, like next week, I hope, maybe this week. And um, anyway, so that's imminent. And um, so we, we found ourselves in a position where we needed to hire this position from the outside. And so we have hired some experienced, more mature workers because we're looking for that professional maturity and finding that and someone who's had more life experience. We also have multiple software programs that are pretty complex. And so we're trying to teach them and finding it's taking a long time for our mature workers. And I, they're, they're my age, you know, but I, I, took, a, I took a typewriter to college. Uh, my kids have grown up with a computer and, and the millennials, I think, they've all had access to that. So they, they approach it from a, a different place. So now I'm, I'm wondering if that's, if that's the way to go or if it really makes more sense to take some agile minds and um, teach them the tasks and then focus the training efforts on professional maturity, sales skills, and interpersonal skills. And assuming that we could achieve the same excellent result for our members in either direction, then I have to look at what's the, what's the more economic way of going about that. So that's something that, that is a challenge, a current challenge for me. Great. Harry. Good morning. <clears throat> well, so for, for me, I think what's been interesting to observe in the millennials is the, uh, the gender shift in potential leaders. Um, I'm looking at my organization and succession planning, and it's really easy to identify uh, leaders in female uh, millennials. It's very difficult in, in the male millennials. And so, I mean, look at our panel. You can see it's, it, 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 there's a shift in, in gender <laughs> leadership. <laughs> and uh, I think it's a good thing. And, uh, and so I think one of the things I struggle with in my blue collar workforce is identifying those uh, young men, ten, blue collar tends to be more male oriented, is identifying those boys that can be leaders in the future. So I think that's interesting. Um, another kind of uh, anecdotal thing that's interesting with millennials is not only are you drawn into texting in terms of communicating with them, but you're also required to include emojis <laughs> so, that the, so that the context of your communication, and there is a difference between an emoji and an emoticon, and I refuse to use emojis with my employees, but I will put a smiley face once in a while. <laughs> they really want to know that, hey, am I okay? So um, I also think that the traditional, um, you know, I, I come from a military, I'm, I'm, I'm a baby boomer, I feel very old up here, and I was raised by a, a military father, and so my idea of the buttoned up strong leader is my idea of how I lead, but I think that's an obsolete model. I think that uh, how we interact with these millennials is, is really different. I think you have to, that there's so much, there's so many things competing for their attention and I think you have to create an extremely varied workforce, an interesting workforce. You have to create opportunities for them to uh, collaborate and work in teams. I mean, the social media has br brought these guys together like we never thought. And uh, I think you have to, the, the traditional way of, of doing tasks, uh, setting goals, and running in a straight line uh, to the finish line is, is obsolete. These guys want to zigzag and go through all different kinds of hoops, and it keeps them interesting, um, keeps it interesting for them. And I think the management bluff is over. I think that um, you have to be very authentic if you're in leadership with millennials. And, um, and they can see when, uh, when you're not bought in to the things that you're requiring of them. And so um, if, you're, if you're not gonna live it, uh, don't preach it with millennials. They're, they're very savvy. I think that um, uh, through, they've had this compressed experience of interacting with people through social media and they're much more, in my opinion, uh, have, have higher emotional IQ than I ever did, uh, you know, at, at that age. So those are my perspectives. Thank you much. And Jennifer. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I feel like I have the easy 
um, last position, and I have to agree with Harry right away, and how you're dealing with the millennials and your younger employees in the workforce that when they come in the door, many times, depending on the profession, you're spending between twenty-seven to $50,000 to bring them in the door. And I say that for, for th careers like law enforcement and public safety, because you're doing a lot of psychologicals. There's a lot of things that you have to do, plus the training. And I speak from a municipal standpoint and also a, a Department of Defense standpoint, because I, I'm a veteran. And so I've, I've worked in both arenas. Uh, I'm not an employer. I'm an observer. And one thing that I can say about management is, you know, the traditional manager uh, has to be able to, to work with these employees and articulate all the way down the chain through the levels of supervision that they have uh, what the policies are, what the procedures are, how does everybody treat it in the workplace, how do they, you know, resolve their problems. Uh, because what's happening is you're getting a highly motivated, you've spent a lot of money to bring this person on board, you have a highly motivated employee, and after two years, um, they, they come in wanting to contribute greatly to the organization, but they feel as if they see double standards based on the, the other ages in the workforce, which you're allowing this, what this manager is allowing certain employees of the peer group to do is different from others. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like the, the, the not exciting part of what I'm trying to tell you, but I think if you have clear policies and a chain of command in your organization and you know how to engage these young people that are in your workforce, I mean, the thing to, to get more value out of them and get more loyalty out of them, and what I'm observing is you have to engage them in the process of improving the organization, and um, they, they have to feel that they have input for success. because. Lacking that, unfortunately, because they, because of the, the excitement and the many things, many directions that they want to go in, um, they'll they'll get to the point where they're not happy, and they they will go and find another job, not necessarily a better job, just another job where they feel you know like they're more part of the uh, the organization, you know. And I like to say that. Um, our employees are our lifeblood, whether you're in a corporation, a small business, you work for government in any level, you really need to retain these people. And if you don't find the creative ways to do that and employ folks that can help you with the training and help you with the, uh, the, the tools that you need, you're going to constantly, in some businesses, in some, you're going to constantly be making that, let's say, worst case, $50,000 $50, investment to get a person in the door. And you want to you try to, we don't have that kind of money. A lot of us don't have that kind of money to pay. So um, I would just say that um, recognize their contributions, know how to communicate with them, and be consistent with them and other employees in the workforce. Um, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Here are some things that research has demonstrated that folks have had some challenges with or some clashes with. Work ethic. So older people think younger people don't have one. And one of the reasons for that is because older people tend to think your work ethic is demonstrated by the amount of hours you put in on the job. <coughs> younger people disagree. Learn to use your computer. You can get home earlier. Uh, establish ways of doing business. <laughs> We've always done it this way. No, get rid of that. Uh, technical competence and comfort, there, there we go, and our IT guy is fed up with showing me which buttons to push, uh, so I, I need to write this down. Loyalty, older people think younger people don't have it. You job hop. Uh, balancing work and family, younger people tend to want to do it. Older people want you to be dedicated to your job. How do we know you're dedicated? By the hours you put in. Yeah. Perks, people want different stuff. I had a uh, Gen Y manager give me a day off with pay as a thank you. I didn't want a day off with pay. I'm just gonna be home working. I wanted more money. Come on, give me more money or give me a title, either one, or a bigger office. Uh, people skills, older people think that younger people don't have it. Notions of gender roles. By the way, you can't only hire men for certain jobs. Don't know if you've gotten that memo yet. Uh, so, uh, change and younger people that's part of the deal. You change constantly. I mean, how old is your iPhone? Come on. All right, so 
One of the things that I've experienced uh, with some of my clients is the amount of feedback. This is just one of the examples, the amount of feedback that people give. So veterans are, were raised with no news is good news. If my manager is not talking to me, I'm doing okay, and I, that's just how I want to keep it. Just stay under the radar and don't look at me. Boomers created the performance evaluation. I'll talk to you once a year, and I'll document it in case you sue me. <laughs> Xer, sorry to interrupt, but how am I doing? And, you know, look at me a little bit more. And wires, feedback whenever I want it at the push of a button. And so I had a young woman helping me set up for a workshop one day, very carefully putting all the handouts on the table. I thought she was going too slow myself, but I didn't say anything. And when she got done putting the papers on the table, she said to me, did I do a good job or what? Yeah, that's what my boomer mentality said. <laughs> I said, yeah, you did a great job putting papers on a table. Good for you. Uh, I didn't say that. I said, yes, you did. I appreciate how conscientious you were. Thank you. Now, it took me, oh, you're laughing at that. All right. It took me three seconds to say it. Why did I say it? Because that's what she needed to hear. And why do I say it? because I need her to do a good job for me. It takes me three seconds. I can invest that time. All right. So uh, another, veterans have a tendency not to question or challenge authority or the status quo. And Xers and Yers may be confused by that because they've been taught to question authority. And Xers and Yers may fail to listen to veterans and boomers because we talk too long and have too many stories, all right? If you want them to listen, put it in 140 characters or less <laughs> with some emojis. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So uh, the panel has already come up with some of the things that they've come up with, but I want to give those who have not already made uh, their solutions known some things that they've come up with, and then I'll tell you what the research says. And then we have Ryan to tell us all about it and wrap it up. All right, so uh, who would like to add anything? Harry, anything to what you've said before? I think, I, I think I'm tapped out right now. Okay, Harry, <laughs> Harry has problems, no solutions. All right, Sandra. <laughs> I'll speak up. Okay, I got your back, Harry. Thank you. Um, well, for us, it's you know something that another panel member uh, brought up is also investing time in uh, training and di learning different ways to communicate. Um, we've also, our company has also utilized Robin services and we found that not only is it informative, but it's also an, a very, uh, provides a lot of aha moments for our managers that never really thought how they manage certain generations uh, was received or, or how more effective they could be if they learned to recognize the individual and their needs. So, you know, one of the things, for example, that, that came to mind while, while Robin was speaking is ADA. ADA is something that affects our older generation at the workplace for obvious reasons. There may be some, um, some health issues that develop as they're older. But in our younger generation, surprisingly enough, we get a lot of accommodation requests as well because they're very aware of what's available. And so for me, it's, it's an interesting, you know, dynamic in that our older generation and our younger generation are conscious of the same issue. And that's something that I never really would have thought of had I not actually see it evolve. And so for me, it's really just listening and understanding um, what forms of communication we can offer, what type of training will benefit our staff, and encouraging involvement, because some of our managers don't like training. And we have to remind them that it's going to benefit them. And of course, you know, we force them to sometimes, but, <laughs> but we want to make sure that they understand that overall it's going to benefit them and their group. And so for us, that's been very successful, is reaching out to outside resources for training. Oh, he does have one. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say that this, I chose the panel, but I did not tell them to tell you to hire me. So I just want to make that clear. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, and this is going to be a plug for Robin, oh, but one of, the, one of the things that I have found in those, you know, it's easy to manage easy people, but it's those tough people that you just can't seem to connect with. And one of the things that's unlocked that beyond understanding millennials and Gen Xers and those kinds of things is personality typing. And I'm a huge believer in, in Myers-Briggs and, 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 and with those individuals where I've had, I just can't figure out how to get through to them, Myers-Briggs has unlocked kind of that key to understanding this, it's not 
that they're bad or I'm good or I'm right or they're wrong or whatever. It's just it's a, they're a different type of person. They communicate differently. They understand things differently, and they might not understand what I'm trying to communicate. So, Robin does this kind of training, and, and you can you can do it online. It's a it's a great way to kind of unlock some of these difficult relationships you have in the in workforce. One of the things we've talked about is technology and the differences when we approach those. I have teenage sons, and at a recent freshman orientation at, in high school, they talked about the BYOD policy, and I, like, what is that? And they said, bring your own device. And they were actually instructing my child to bring his cell phone, that ha or his smartphone, or iPad to school. And it blew my mind, because I can't comprehend this. And it's an issue that we really struggle with, with our frontline team members especially. Um, they want to have their cell phones with them at all times. And so um, some solutions to deal with that, I think first and foremost are looking, re-examining your policies. When is it okay to have a cell phone? When is it and communicating that clearly and, and really working with that. The other thing that, that we do is when it, it's not as important when they're not serving a member, for instance, um, especially in our training classes, 